वेलकम स्टूडेंट्स टूडेज क्लास इज ऑन पिको आर एन ए वायरसेस सो पिको आर एन ए वायरसेस बिलोंग टू फैमिली पिको आर एन ए वेरीडे येस यू हैव हर्ड इट राइट वी हैव टू प्रोनाउंस इट एज पिको आर एन ए नॉट पिकॉर्ना बिकॉज पिको मीन्स स्मॉल एंड आर एन ए इज द आर एन न्यूक्लिक एसिड ऑफ द वायरस सो पिको आर एन ए वायरसेस आर वेरी लार्ज ग्रुप ऑफ आर एन ए वायरसेस विच आर very small in size about a 25 to 30 nanometers humans are the only natural hosts and they cause variety of diseases ranging from simple common cold to paralysis meningitis hepatitis etc if you look into the classification they belong to family pico rna viride which includes 47 or more genera but let us concentrate only on genera of human importance the genera of human importance are enterovirus rhinovirus par echo virus and hepatovirus we can remember this with a mnemonic herp h for hepatovirus e for enterovirus r for rhino virus and p for par echo virus in the genera ento enterovirus there are a group of viruses which are polio virus coxsacky virus eco virus and other enteroviruses rhino virus includes about 100 zero types and hepatovirus genera includes hepatitis a virus it's very important to re remember that hepatitis a virus belongs to family pico rna viridae look me to the morphology of pico rna viruses it's pico in size that is the size is just 28 to 30 nanometers which we can remember with the first alphabet p in the name and symmetry is icosahedral the capsid has 60 subunits and each subunit has four viral proteins vp1 vp2 vp3 and vp4 vp1 to vp3 are, are the surface proteins which help in attachment of the or binding of the antibody and vp4 is the internal protein which is attached or related with the nucleic acid so for the c we can remember the capsid with vp1 and to vp4 proteins and o we can remember that it's non enveloped virus and r it's a rna virus which is single stranded and positive sense the replication occurs in the cytoplasm of the host cell so if we recollect back most of the rna viruses where do they replicate in the cytoplasm of the host cell what are the two exceptions the ortho mixo virus and the retro virus now let us move on and learn about the enteroviruses that is one of the genera in the family pico rna viridae which includes five groups which when we look into the classification of enteroviruses it, it includes five groups polio virus coxsacky virus group a coxsacky virus group b echo virus and enteroviruses the same name is repeating enterovirus which are types 68 to 116 or more polio virus includes three serotypes serotype 1 to 3 coxsacky virus group a includes 23 serotypes 1 to 22 and then 24 there is no 23 number coxsacky virus group b which includes six serotypes 1 to 6 and echo virus includes about a 29 serotypes when we look into the general characteristics of enterovirus they are all transmitted by feco oral route that is by con ingestion of contaminated food and water they are very stable at acidic ph in the stomach so they do not die at the acidic ph they replicate in the pharynx as well as in the small intestine and they cause a variety of neurological and non neurological diseases neurological diseases like paralysis and non neurological diseases like 
it, they also cause even conjunctivitis we'll be knowing about them in subsequent slides when they are multiplying in the elementary tract they are excreted in the feces but they do not cause diarrhea these are the general characteristics we have to remember about the enteroviruses in today's class let us start learning about polio virus so most of us know polio virus causes acute flaccid paralysis uh, a condition known as poliomyelitis you can see in this picture the children suffering from polio myelitis an acute infectious disease mainly involving the central nervous system if you look at the term poliomyelitis it's this word is from the greek origin the polios means gray the gray matter and mylos is the spinal cord so there is itis is inflammation of the motor neurons in the spinal cord so poliomyelitis is an acute flaccid paralysis which is common in children less than 5 years and where does the pathological lesion lie in the lower motor neurons present in the anterior horns of the spinal cord in the gray matter you have to remember that polio virus affects the motor neurons but not the sensory neurons looking into the history this virus is you know can be traced back to the ancient egyptian era if you see in the picture on this uh, egyptian stel we can see this man with a withered leg uh, and probably he was a victim of polio you can see his leg muscles atrophied and he's taking the help of a stick to walk and another picture if you see on to your right uh this there was a polio uh, epidemic in 1950s and they created a special ward which was known as iron lung ward because they were supporting mechanical ventilation to the polio virus disease patient they were giving ventilatory support because of uh, difficulty in breathing they faced because of involvement of uh, nerves innervating the diaphragm looking to the resistance the polio virus is very much resistant to acids to the bile salts it survives for months at 4 degrees centigrade and years at minus 20 degrees centigrade magnesium chloride protects the virus against heat inactivation why should we know this because one of the component in the polio vaccine to, to prevent the vaccine strains from heat inactivation is magnesium chloride and polio virus does not survive lyophilization what is lyophilization so most of the bacteria and viruses they are stored by a lyophilization that is freeze drying they are frozen and then then they are dehydrated to remove the water so they can survive or they can be stored for longer period but polio virus does not survive lyophilization these are important mcqs looking into the antigenic types of the polio virus there are three serotypes of polio virus polio virus 1 2 and 3 which are determined based on neutralization test and each serotype has a prototype strain that is the first strain which was isolated the prototype strain of serotype 1 is called brunhild after the name of chimpanzee which which, which was experimented with polio virus the prototype strain of serotype 2 is known as lansing uh, from a patient who died of paralytic polio in this place called lansing and sero- the prototype strain of serotype 3 is leon uh named after a 11 year old boy who died of paralytic polio in los angeles each of the serotype has two antigens one is the d antigen dense antigen also known as n or the naive antigen which is associated with infectious virus particle and c antigen known as capsid or coreless antigen and also known as h antigen which is the heated antigen which is associated with mt virion so which antigen is important or which antigen is specific for the uh, serotypes of polio it is the d antigen which is type specific where c is a common antigen present in all the serotype so d antigen induces neutralizing antibody antibodies in the patient so having known this we have to also know that potency of injectable polio vaccine ipv stands for injectable polio vaccine 
is measured in terms of d antigen units so having learned about antigenic types now let us move on to the epidemiology looking into the epidemiology the serotype 1 of polio virus is most commonly associated with paralytic poliomyelitis it's associated with the outbreaks of paralytic polio myelitis looking into the serotype 2 it's a potent antigenic strain it is most commonly associated with vdpv that is vaccine derived polio virus and serotype 3 is more uh, it most commonly causes vaccine associated paralytic polio myelitis vapp so this vdpv and vapp are uh, genetic alterations in the vaccine strains which uh, cause uh, paralysis in the patient we'll be knowing more in detail about them in subsequent uh, slides okay for now you remember that serotype 1 is most common cause of paralytic poliomyelitis serotype 2 is a potent antigenic strain and it is most commonly associated with vdpv and serotype 3 is a one which causes vaccine associated most commonly causes vaccine associated paralytic poliomyelitis you can remember with a mnemonic opv that's why it's highlighted in the red okay and uh, by now two out of three polio virus strains have been eradicated that is serotype 2 was the first one to be you know eradicated uh, the last case of which was seen in 1999 and it was declared eradicated in 2015 and serotype 3 the last case has been seen in 2012 and it has been declared in uh, eradicated in 2019 so what is it still remaining it is serotype 1 it has been uh, still the cases have been uh, recorded in afghanistan and pakistan okay let us now move on to the pathogenesis so the mode of transmission the most common route is feco oral route that is ingestion of contaminated food and water and the less common routes are by respiratory droplets of the infected patient and also by direct inoculation into conjunctiva and the spread is mainly by hematogenous route there can also be a direct neural spread uh, especially following tonsillectomy so the patient is also already infected with uh, polio virus and following tonsillectomy the virus which is multiplying in the tonsils can you know enter through the glossopharyngeal nerve in the pharyngeal fossa to the central nervous system causing paralysis and this paralysis is usually bulbar type of paralysis we'll be seeing what this bulbar type of paralysis is okay so now let us move on to the uh, pathogenesis once the virus has entered the elementary tract it multiplies there in the epithelial cells of the intestinal mucosa this is known as elementary phase it multiplies there it ruptures the epithelial cells it is released and then it enters into the lymphatics it mainly involves tonsils in the oropharynx it involves the pears patches in the intestine and the mesenteric lymph nodes where it multiplies and then it enters the blood stream which is known as viremic phase viremia is presence of virus in the blood initial release from the lymphatics into the blood stream it's known as primary viremia from where it enters the reticulo endothelial system that is spleen liver where it multiplies and again is released back into the blood which is known as secondary viremia so what happens in this viremic phase if you see in the second slide usually the patient by now the virus might be cleared and he remains asymptomatic or he might suffer from a minor illness or abortive illness wherein he is having just fever sore throat and mild uh, git symptoms like nausea vomiting and anorexia otherwise the virus might invade the central nervous system and result in neurological phase wherein there are two ways it enters the central nervous system one is it directly crosses the blood brain barriers uh, by entering you know it is within the phagocytes and it enters the uh, central nervous system it en enters the csf and brain and, and it might cause aseptic meningitis or it can cause encephalitis the other route of entering the central nervous system is the virus in the blood might enter the interstitial tissue of the skeletal muscles from where it invades the peripheral nerves which are innervating the skeletal muscles and by the retrograde axonal transport it reaches the anterior horns of spinal cord causing lot of disruption there and resulting in paralytic polio 
myelitis and how is this exactly causing uh, paralytic poliomyelitis let us look at in in this slide so one it is once it has uh, entered the peripheral nerves and it is making a retrograde travel it, it reaches the cns it reaches the motor neurons the lower motor neurons in the anterior horns of the spinal cord and uh, all this results in lot of inflammatory cells reaching the site which cause the neural destruction they cause demyelination and other ways when it's replicating within these uh, neurons it's causing degeneration of the nasal bodies present there in the cytoplasm uh, of the neurons which are aggregates of ribosomes which help in protein synthesis which are actually responsible for neuronal growth and axonal regeneration so these are destroyed the nasal bodies uh, present in the axon are destroyed so there's no there are no more signals reaching to the skeletal muscles or neither are there any growth factors reaching to the skeletal muscles so there is complete weakness in the muscles of the trunk and the limb causing flaccid paralysis i hope it was clear in the second slide if you look at the diagram it's a brief uh, you know view of the pathogenesis the root is fecooral and once uh, it enters it it uh, multiplies in the tonsils in the pears patches of the intestine and from there it is you know uh, reaching the blood stream causing viremia and from um, uh, there it can reach to the central nervous system uh, crossing the blood brain barrier reaching the csf and brain causing meningitis or encephalitis and other route if you see the pictorial representation it is from the blood stream it is reaching the interstitial tissue of the skeletal muscle invading the peripheral nerves and making a retrograde axonal uh, travel to reach the cns and this it makes by a uh, the receptor cd155 Now let us move on to the clinical manifestations. The clinical manifestation, if looking at the clinical manifestations, it can be an inapparent or asymptomatic infection. Ninety percent of patients are asymptomatic. Okay, then remaining five percent, they suffer from abortive or minor illness. We have seen that it's just simple headaches, sore throat, nausea, anorexia, etc. 1 to 2% of patients they suffer from non paralytic poliomyelitis which is aseptic meningitis or encephalitis less than 1% of patients are suffering with paralytic poliomyelitis there is also a clinical syndrome known as post polio syndrome so now let us look into what is non paralytic poliomyelitis so in non paralytic poliomyelitis we have seen how the virus is reaching from the blood into the central nervous system by crossing the blood brain barrier uh, through the phagocytes okay? the virus is within the phagocyte it is it crosses the blood brain barrier reaches the csf brain causes aseptic meningitis and encephalitis or encephalitis so what are the symptoms because of lot of meningeal irritation there is fever there is headache there is lot of irritability the stiffness in the muscles of the neck and the spine and these are the meningeal irritation is elicited with following signs the koenig sign the brudzinski sign and there is a sign known as tripod sign okay so we've already learned about the signs in uh, meningitis caused by neisseria meningitis isn't it but as such there is no paralysis in the uh, in this case and when you do a csf analysis there is lymphocytic pleocytosis that is this ele elevation of lymphocyte count and the glucose levels of the csf are normal the proteins are slightly elevated and if you culture the csf uh, fluid it's bacteriologically sterile so this type of meningitis is known as aseptic meningitis or viral meningitis okay so now let us look into these signs what is koenig sign um, when the patient is in supine position and when you flex his knee to 90 degrees and the hip is also flexed at 90 degrees and further when you try to extend his knee it is very painful and the the patient limits the extension because this is because of stiffness in the hamstring muscles looking into brudzinski sign 
when the patient lies supine and when you try to passively flex his neck there is even you know flexion of hip and knees this is because of the stiffness in the neck muscles looking into tripod sign or mos sign tripod because his seating position is like a tripod stand and mos after the person who is uh, you know uh, who has uh, said that there's something called tripod sign which can be elicited in poliomyelitis or neurological diseases after his name it's known after his name it's known as mos sign in mos sign when you ask the patient who's lying on the bed to get up you can see he gets up and sits like what you can see in the first picture wherein his hands are supporting their behind him his hips and knees are flexed and his neck is extended and his uh, spine is also lordotic he doesn't want to flex his spine and all this posture he assumes to remove the weight of the spinal cord okay so this is tripod sign kiss the knee sign is also the same thing uh, because you know when you when you ask the patient who is sitting on the chair to bend down and kiss his knees he doesn't do it because he doesn't want any uh, pressure on his spine so rather he tries to lift up his leg legs up to kiss them okay so these are couple of signs which are good to know now let us move on to paralytic polio myelitis which accounts for less than 1% of cases the clinical forms of paralytic polio myelitis are spinal polio bulbar polio and bulbo spinal polio spinal polio which have which we have discussed all through in the pathogenesis accounts for the most common form where there is involvement of lower motor neurons in the spinal cord whereas bulbar polio which is very rare only 2% of cases it, it there is brain stem involvement and bulbo spinal It accounts for the 20% of cases with combination of both. So let us look into spinal paralytic polio. Most common form constitutes 80% of cases involves the lower motor neurons in the anterior horns of the spinal cord, where there is hypotonia of the muscles. There is loss of deep reflexes. There is lot of muscle atrophy or wasting, and the paralysis here is asymmetrical. That is, there is the proximal limb muscles are more involved. then the distal limb muscles and in severe cases you can also see quadriplegia paralysis of abdominal and thoracic muscles there is no sensory loss here there is only the motor neurons which are involved in polio and usually the recovery is within 4 to 8 weeks beyond which there can be some residual paralysis left so this was about spinal polio looking into bulbar polio myelitis very rare form only 2% of cases but very much life threatening where there is brain stem stem involvement there is mid brain pons and medulla are involved so the centers there like respiratory centers involved causing respiratory failure uh, heat regulation center is involved causing hypo or hyperthermia and cranial nerve nuclei are involved uh, resulting in dysphagia difficulty in speaking there is nasal tone there is nasal regurgitation of fluids this quint okay so this was about bulbar polio myelitis looking into the post polio syndrome in the second slide usually what happens following polio virus infection we know that it damages the motor neurons so this the motor neurons innervating the skeletal muscle are damaged but what do the healthy neurons surrounding them do they form collaterals and they substitute for them and the patient is okay that is what you can see in this Uh, picture here the blue ones are the motor neurons invading the skeletal muscle they have been damaged by polio virus so the yellow ones are the collaterals which have been formed by the healthy neurons for that time the patient is okay after 2 to 3 decades that is uh, once the patient is aged due to natural aging process these motor neurons die and then he suffers from extensive loss of muscle function so this is about the post polio syndrome i hope pathogenesis and clinical presentation was clear now let us move on to the laboratory diagnosis the specimens to be collected the best specimen is the rectal swab or the stool because the shedding of virus is up to 4 weeks throat swab is less preferred the shedding is seen up to 1 week and the least preferred are the serum and the csf 
these specimens have to be transported immediately to the lab in case of delay we have to use a viral transport media or they have to be stored at 4 degrees centigrade if there's delay expected for 24 to 48 hours and if you have to store for months to years they have to be stored at minus 20 degrees centigrade if you look at the processing the processing involves viral isolation that is viral uh, the culture of the in the cell lines serology molecular methods like pca PCR and simple CSF analysis. We already discussed about the CSF analysis in aseptic meningitis. So looking into the viral culture in the cell lines, the preferred cell lines are primary monkey kidney cell lines where the growth is identified after 3 to 6 days with a cytopathic effect wherein the cell lines are rounded, pygnotic, refractile, so the cell death actually. But this is not, uh, it's, it's seen in all the enterovirus viruses, so it's not characteristic just of polio virus. So we have to detect the antigen in the cell lines by neutralization with a specific antisera. So uh, the growth in cell lines is only a sensitive method uh, because you can't differentiate between the wild polio virus strain and vaccine strain. Say if the patient has been vaccinated, and the anti, uh, the, the, there are some vaccine strains you can't differentiate. So to differentiate the wild strain from vaccine strain and the best, the sensitive and the specific method is the molecular method that is reverse transcriptase PCR targeting the VP1 region. Looking into serology, it is not very reliable method uh, because of variety of uh, factors. So any rise in the antibody titer in the paid sera which can be detected by neutralization or test or complement fixation test or ELISA has to be viewed in, in the light of clinical presentation and history. Why we will know now, say if the patient is immunodeficient, though he is suffering from poliovirus viral disease, he will not elicit, he will not, there will be no antibodies detected. Next a vaccinated person, the person is already vaccinated. Their antibodies circulating against the polio virus, so you should not misinterpret them as suffering from polio viral disease. And cross reactivity, there will be cross reactivity of these antibodies of polio virus with uh, antibodies of coxsackie and echovirus. So serology is not a very reliable method. So I hope laboratory diagnosis was clear. Please try attempting this question. Classify enteroviruses. Uh, describe the pathogenesis and laboratory diagnosis of polio virus. It's a very important question. Uh, so I hope the topic was clear. Thank you students.